the empire of the rising sun has risen. The western barbarians will bow before us. Well, Red Alert 3 is really a, fan, uh, a fantastic story. Uh, you know, I think it's really fantastic when a game has all that gameplay, but there really is a dramatic story weaving through it, and, and we really have one. The, the writers uh, really spent a lot of time developing this story. That was a win-win for everyone, Commander. Well, not the Reds. For them, it was more of a lose-lose. It basically is a story where uh, the Russian faction goes back in time, takes Einstein out, and that changes the history of the world. So that there are now three factions in the world, the Soviet faction, the Allied faction, and the Imperial faction. Uh, they are fighting for control of the world. President Ackerman is uh, very self-assured, smug, some might say, and uh, about as extreme a hawk as you're likely to find. Oh, Pucky, you know those Russians can't be trusted. They hate everything we stand for. Freedom, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, apple pie. Did I say freedom? President Ackerman is not particularly open-minded about uh, any kind of potential partnership with the, uh, the commies, as he calls them. You ready to send those commies running back to their mommies? Field Marshal Bingham is, uh, is an ally of uh, President Ackerman and of the United States, and uh, there are times when they will butt heads, uh, one time notably, but uh, for most of the game, they're uh, staunch allies. I'll tell you what, Bingham, I like this new commander. Let's send him to France so we can kick a little more commie butt. I, actually, sir, I was considering that very possibility. Uh, Field Marshal Bingham is very much the um, old-school military. He's a bit like characters that you used to see in Second World War films, with a stiff upper lip. And um, he's very honest, very trustworthy, and is, uh, I think, a little suspicious of the motives of the American president. The leaders of all the other allied nations already agreed. Not me. Not the U.S. of by God, A. Eh? You're making a very big mistake, my friend. You mark my words. Commander Warren Fuller is the uh, is basically the commander that works with the gamer uh, as in in charge of the Allied forces uh, who will fight against the the Soviets and the Empire of the Rising Sun uh, and everybody else in the game. This won't be the last time we meet, and next time your general won't be there to rescue you. My character is Lisette. She's a commander for the Allies, and um, you can choose her to play with you. And um, she's kind of sassy. You know, she has her own little thing going on. She doesn't look tough, but she can kick some ass. Well, that's a relief. When I heard you guys were coming, I thought it was going to be a tough fight. One of the people you're going to love is Gemma Atkinson, who plays um, a wonderful role in this. She's one of the most beautiful women you'll ever see. Your job is here, on dry land. And be on the lookout, sir. They know you're here. Yeah, my character is called Eva, and she's an allied military briefer. She basically appears to be very straight, very kind of, you know, clued up. The free world is now in your hands. But in actual fact, she has a soft spot for the commander. And she has a bit of a problem with Tanya, played by Jenny McCarthy. Uh, I think there's a bit of rivalry going on because they both kind of want the commander's attention. I'm glad to see you made it back in one piece, Commander. Excellent job. You can flirt with the Commander later, Lieutenant. Right now, we have a job to do. The character I play is Tanya, and she is a bit of a badass. Maybe not even a bit. She's a lot of a badass. She can kill a man 15 different ways with her bare hands. So a word of advice, don't get on her bad side. Um, you know, I'll tell you the scene that I'm excited to do. Um, there's an interrogation scene where I kind of get um, 
busted a little bit from my commander and lieutenant um, while I'm trying to interrogate um, Sergi to find out where the headquarters are. I've never really uh, done a scene where I've actually almost hurt somebody. <laughs> so I'm excited to try to get information out of him. That you're going to have to do on your own. Uh, Jenny's my, my rival, um, in Red Alert 3, and yes, yes, I think I could probably take her in an MMA fight without a problem, and I'd probably just, uh, you know, put her to sleep with a nice chokehold or something, just to make sure it's not too painful, because she seems like a pretty sweet person. <laughs> I hope you were satisfied with Natasha's contribution on the battlefield. She's one of our finest. Denko, the character that I play, is a soldier, but he's also a politician, and he's a great maneuverer. And for several years, he's been working on a on a on a secret project, which is in fact a time machine. No, sir. Twelve months ago, I was put in charge of a top secret project, and things get so bad that he coerces, really, General Krukov. To taking a trip in the time machine into Brussels in 1927. This war should never have happened. We went back in time to save ourselves and everything changed. Peter Stormari is out of his mind. I mean, he's... You could commit him tomorrow. He's very funny. Um, and perfect casting for a mad scientist, actually. Because his instincts are... I think you could say insane. Commander, this is Dr. Gregor Zelensky, possibly the greatest scientific mind of our time. Oh, no, that was another far great. <laughs> well, he's working for the government, and he has a pretty good salary. I presume he's a loner, and he's devoted to his job. I mean, he is determined to do good in this world, but Working for the military, sometimes his inventions and his cleverness is being misused. Prepare these coordinates. No, please, please. Now! Sir, no! One of the rules of the space-time continuum in which you travel in space, in time, is that you mustn't touch anything or anyone because it turns to chrono dust. Not touch nothing. We mustn't do anything to disrupt space-time continuum. And I think he is a decent scientist who wants to do better and to create something better for this world. But as any scientist with talent, he is a little bit, you know, loony as well. Working with, with, uh, with Peter Stormar and, and Tim Curry has, uh, has been wonderful. Oftentimes, uh, I find myself watching them and, and watching their characters uh, come through. Whatever it is, it is too late. Time is on our side. And of course, uh, if you control time, you can control essentially uh, uh, what you do and, and, and how, uh, how much power you have over it. And in one stroke, we've wiped out nuclear technology because it just won't exist. So we're going back to a very, very different world. And he thinks triumphantly to a new world order. But unfortunately, <laughs> through, through the time-space continuum, there is a huge new enemy, which is the Empire of the Rising Sun. They're attacking! There are too many! We have to evacuate! Who is attacking? The Imperial War Machine has been unleashed. Do not struggle against what is inevitable. The Empire of the Rising Sun has risen. Well, Emperor Yoshiro is a powerful, powerful leader. And uh, he's also very traditional. He believes in, it's a very Japanese uh, philosophy that tradition is important, that uh, there are forces that 
predetermine what the future is going to be. A will not resist, my son. Not after seeing our crushing of the Soviets. But father, we have intelligence from my spy. Deep within Allied command, they are planning an attack at our base. The conflict is with a generation that doesn't necessarily subscribe to that, uh, that view of life, that uh, philosophy. Thank you, Commander. You have honored your ancestors and defeated our enemies. Working with George Takei was awesome. I mean, I'm growing up, I was a Trekkie fan, so so being able to work with with Sulu and you know is is, is awesome, and he's a great guy. I'm playing General Tatsu. He's the son of Emperor Yoshio. He is a bit more of a, a rebellious type in the game, I guess, and he definitely uh, definitely uh, will resort to violence or warring before his father would. Commander. Allow me to introduce to you our Chief Logistical Officer, Ms. Suki Toyama. It is an honor. The Toyama family has served the Emperor for ten generations. My character is kind of um, uh, interesting because she's very fun and cute and, um, and sadistic. <laughs> if you could put all those words together. And, um, and she takes great pleasure in in conquering um, the opposition and watching people get maimed and killed. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just your average everyday girl. <laughs> General, your highness, we are intercepting a flood of transmissions between the Allies and the Soviets. They are assembling a joint task force to attack our mainland. The Soviets and Allies together? Red Alert 3 is about the most colorful game uh, this team's done, from uh, Battle for Middle Earth to Command and Conquer 3, and now this one, we've definitely gotten brighter and more saturated and more colorful this time. The process for our cinematics involves a lot of different people on the team. It's not just the, the cinematics guys who are you know, directing and, and shooting and, and editing and providing the audio and, and uh, all of that, but um, it really starts from design and uh, design coming up with the locations and the settings and what's the story that needs to take place in those cinematics. And then from there it goes to art and we start uh, creating costumes for those characters and um, sets for them to to tell their story in um, and all that has to happen before it gets into the hands of the the cinematics guys who really put it down on on tape um, or on a hard drive as the case may be so um, it started out where do some quick sketches uh, and made cardboard models and on there you're able to show the stages we knew we would have probably two stages so all the sets and in this case we had 11 sets now on Command and Conquer 3, we had three large sets and probably six small little entities that we were shooting with green screen. Um, and this was amazing. When you put the cardboard models out, you really, and you colorize certain parts of the model, you're really able to see the game ahead of time. Because what it does for them is they're able to see where these segments with the actors are going, going to fit in um, into their, you know, their CG world. We have a shot then, uh, looking this way, mm -hmm. at them, where they come to the door. We can have a technician open the door if we want, or they open the door. Um, what we do is we have to translate it for camera. We have to make it work for what they're going to be shooting technically. So it has to work for the camera to move and to dolly. We knew we wanted different areas to use and not just be stuck looking into the set. So. We knew he'd be with his son, the, the Emperor would be with Tatsu. So we created, even using the Shoji uh, screen, for example, we played it initially that you're inside, you know, looking at the whole room, we played him standing in front, and then later we were able to make it look like an exterior part, like you were on the other side of the Shoji screen, by bringing in reeded outdoor, you know, uh, bamboo screens, we, we put out bonsai plants. Uh, we had a fan going for the little bristling leaves, and you really felt like you were sitting outside. My favorite set is definitely uh, the premier's office, uh, where Tim Curry has all of his scenes. Um, because of the color palette that we have for the Soviet faction, that was really the place where, uh, where we got to have some fun. There's a great big red Soviet symbol. Um, 
done on the floor, big red phone, another big red uh, Soviet symbol on the wall, big portrait of Lenin, and that all ties in with just these over-the-top outfits with, you know, big red and gold epaulets and stuff. That's the set really where I felt we, we were able to do the most. It, this was fun for me because there is, I felt there was a lot more detail to, to deal with and a lot more um, fun things, you know, to try and find. All hollow, so it makes for, because uh, we didn't, we actually, especially for this part to move easily too, we couldn't add a lot of weight to it. So putting a lot of big, heavy, you know, real books would uh, definitely change the factor in that. Even though when you look at it here in the studio, they just look like freestanding columns, they're not even attached. When you see this on camera, this will give you the feeling that this space is double the size. You'll feel like there's a whole other half of this room that exists. And that goes into the set dressing that John did, uh, the scale. At some point during the production meeting, they did mention uh, it'd be fun to have a bear of some sort. And uh, at first I was looking for a full life-size, you know, taxidermy bear, but uh, I walked into a place called uh, House of Props and there this fellow was, and uh, I thought it'd be perfect, and I thought it'd be a perfect place on the premier's desk. Welcome back, General. There's a, a point in one scene where uh, Tim Curry opens up a statue, and the button for his his secret elevator is hidden inside the neck of the statue of Lenin. And that's a direct homage to the old TV series that I used to watch as a kid. When we did this, we also had to do a lot of special effects in this set. For example, you know, we have the, the hidden, you know, the elevator, the, a bookcase, you press Lenin's bust head, you open it back, you press a button, it releases this humongous bookcase, and the next thing you know, you have this antique elevator that takes you to the basement, where, of course, you have your time machine. Now that's, you know, you have to make it all look seamless, like, okay, this is how it works. When the, when the gamer is playing the game, you, you, you don't want to hit him with a lot of details, you know, him or her, and uh, that you don't want them to think about the set too much, you know, as far as the details. You just want to uh, present, uh, you know, an, an effect for their game playing, you know, that it's there, and they basically get the idea that what we're trying to present as far as where they are, um, we want to, you know, make them, since it's the Russians and has to do with the Soviets, uh, we want them to feel like, yeah, this could be the Kremlin, you know, the inside of the Kremlin. Um, so you have to present some of those uh, elements that would uh, give that flavor, give that feel. The team put a ton of effort into Red Alert 3, and I think of all the RTS games that I've worked on so far, this is the one I'm the most proud of. And really it just comes down to how fun is it to play. And, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like picking out which one of your children is your favorite, but um, I think I gotta say Red Alert 3 is my favorite. Of everything we've done, this is the game I most enjoy playing. Being a part of Red Alert 3 has just been awesome, and um, I'm super excited to see the end result and see put, it all put together. Um, I'm really excited to have this new fan base, in a, and I think this is the start of like a whole relationship between me and video games, actually. I'm, I'm super stoked on it, man. <laughs> I wish there would be more games in this category. And I think the more video game, the video game evolves all the time. And I think people will demand more. And they will de demand some more depth, not just superficial video games. And here you have one example. I'm happy to be part of it. And there's uh, over an hour's worth of cinematics in this game, um, so it's like a feature interwoven with a game. We took a lot of pride in really writing a great story and making it interesting and casting it with really good people. The whole set and the costumes and, you know, the direction we've been given, it is really fantastic and I think it's going to be, you know, an amazing final product.